Welcome, everybody, to the Paving the Way Home podcast. I'm delighted to be joined this week by Father Niall Leahy, a recently ordained Jesuit priest, an Irish Jesuit priest, but currently joining us tonight from Paris. Father Niall, you're very welcome. Good evening, Brian. Nice to, nice to be here. Yeah. And so, Father Niall, would you kindly lead us in an opening prayer? Yep, absolutely, Brian. Yep. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of life. Uh, especially thank you for the gifts of faith, hope, and love. Uh, ask you to bless our conversation. Um, bless all the people who are hearing and watching. Uh, that whatever is, is shared here and spoken here uh, may be for your greater glory. Um, so that we may uh, praise you and serve you evermore. Uh, we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. For an isle you are, were only ordained in the last uh, few months, is that correct? I was ordained, Brian, on the 22nd of August, uh, the feast of the Queenship of Our Lady in St. Francis Xavier's Church in Gardner Street in Dublin. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fresh off the conveyor belt, yeah. That's fantastic because your journey to priesthood was, was, was quite a, a long journey comparing to maybe someone that goes into other religious orders or uh, even to the diocesan priesthood because the Jesuit the Jesuit uh, journey is, is is that bit longer because I know when I first met you I think it was the summer of 2009 and you were just mm. about to enter I think that August September is that correct that's right yeah 2009 yeah yeah and that's then right. ordained, in a yeah. Long journey. 2020 yeah I mean part of the it, it's it's longer but it's not necessarily more studies that's one thing you know, it's, it's worth mentioning that, yeah, typically for for a guy coming in with a, with a university degree or something, it's 10 years. Uh, that's the standard. Uh, but in terms of the philosophy and, and theology that you'll do uh, in the run-up to ordination, it's the same. But there's an extra four years in there, uh, two years uh, in the novitiate, which is really learning the Jesuit charism because it's a religious order and... No more than if you joined a monastery, you would have to learn the ways of the monastery when you order, when you join an apostolic religious order. You have to understand the history and the spirituality and the charism, etc. Uh, getting used to living in, in community life. Novitiate is also a time of discernment, uh, Brian, when you're really dipping your toe in the water and seeing, is this for me or not, sort of before you get into the studies. Um, so to see how do you get on with living the, the vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. So, yeah, there's two years in a bishop, which is, uh, yeah, a little bit of a, a spiritual, a real time of spiritual deepening, I think, of, of, your, of your life as well. You're learning to rely on God and, you know, more so than, than beforehand. And so there's two years there. And then there are, there's another two years in between philosophy and theology, which are two years spent doing apostolic work. Uh, so it's not studying. Uh, it's, it's living in a Jesuit community, a, a real life Jesuit community. And so I spent my two years teaching uh, at Clongos Wood College in County Kildare. And again, just getting used to living the apostolic life and, and when, yeah, I, and, and then, you know, contributing to, you know, to the mission of, of the society, society of Jesus, that's sort of the official name for, for the Jesuits. And, and then off you go to, to theology. So, uh, yeah, this is my, I was ordained after four years of theology, and this is my fifth year of theology. Now I'm doing an extra year to get the STL licentiate, uh, sort of teaching license uh, in theology. I'm doing that at Centre Sèvres in Paris. So, which actually is where the first Jesuits met and, and came together uh, with their st students at the University of Paris. So it's nice to be here where, the, where this, the Jesuit story began. That's fantastic. And like, what a time for, for yourself as a Jesuit to be ordained a Jesuit during the pontificate of the Jesuit Pope. That must be quite special as well. I have to say, Francis is Pope Francis is uh, he's obviously a leader for the church. I feel at the moment that he's also a spiritual leader for the Jesuits in a way. He's uh, I just see Jesuits looking to him uh, as as a model, uh, really, and and really being taken uh, with I would say his humanity. Uh, you know, he he clearly emphasizes the human touch uh, and. 
and yet he's also a radical. Uh, he's definitely a radical. Uh, he's not afraid to uh, speak truth to power, you know, you know that old phrase. And he's, yeah, I, I'm in, personally, I'm inspired by how he is reforming the Vatican. Uh, I think he has made, I think a lot of the evils in the church, and the church, you know, you know, clearly has a sinful record. Uh, and I think you can trace a lot of them back to kind of corruption in the Vatican and greasy hands. So I, I really admire him for, for just the very difficult job he has of, of reforming and uh, sort of cleaning up uh, a lot of what goes on in Rome. And I, I don't envy him. I think that must be an incredibly hard job. So yeah, I take my hat off to him. Yeah, to be honest, to be in any position of leadership, particularly when in the church, you know, like we all can be hurlers on the ditch and say, oh, you know, a bishop or a yeah. Irish priest or whatever, the Pope or whatever, this, this, this and this. But like you can't even imagine what it must be to be in that in that in situation with the yeah. literally the weight of the world and the uh, on yeah. your shoulders and and that it's it's it's. Yeah. Yeah, must must be unbelievable. And for and I, like I remember, um, like before you entered the the priesthood, um, the the Jesuits, you were very much involved here in Ireland with, uh, particularly with Pure in Heart, um, mm. and we, we do a lot of the U two thousand events, uh, a lot of pilgrimages, mm. uh, uh to, to everywhere. And so, what? First of all, why priesthood, and why the Jesuits in particular? And I asked that question is because you know, particularly here in Ireland. If someone, if people are going into uh, a religious order at the moment, the, it's the Dominican. Dominicans seem to be the big one. And I mean, mm. I know the year you went in, you entered, it was mm. the year that there was a huge intake into Dominicans. There was the huge yeah. intake uh, that year into Maynooth as well for the Deos. And I think it was the year after the the year for priests uh, or the year mm. for vocations uh, or whatever. So there was a massive fruit uh, bearing mm. there in 2009. So why the priesthood and why the Jesuits for you? So priesthood was a hunch, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's this uncomfortable itch that doesn't go away. And it's sort of like saying, why do you scratch an itch? You know, you just sort of have to, you have to, and my sense at the time was at least I have to give it a go. Like I won't know unless I give it a go. And, you know, at that age I was what, 20. So I was discerning, I'd say seriously when I was 26, 27, and uh, I didn't find in myself the commitment to, to a girlfriend. You know, I was, I was dating, but there was a blockage there. And, and I thought, okay, I, I need to give the priesthood a go. Uh, you have very few answers at that point of the journey, um, but you have a hunch and you think, okay, it's, it's a hunch that I worth following. And, uh, so you just take initial steps and you, you know, you, you get in contact with vocation directors and you talk and, you know, does that go well? Does it not go well? Some conversations with vocation directors, you know, for example, I talked to, to Jer, who was the, uh, the Dominican, Father Jared, who was the Dominican director, the vocation director at the time. And I thought, yeah, like that, that was fine, but no. You know, I mean, if you met a girl and you said, oh, yeah, like, she's fine. Well, then that wouldn't be enough to really, you know, pursue it further. Um, and so I literally, like, just went around talking to, you know, like, went to the news and I spoke to the Austin guys. And I, I, I was discerning at the time with uh, Father Leon O'Gillon, uh, who was Jesuit, who was the UCD chaplain at, the, uh, at that time. And when, when I spoke to the Jesuits and I just looked into it, I found a, a generosity within myself, which was new. I thought, okay, uh, I'd say I was, I was quite a reluctant vocation to the priesthood originally, but when I uh, just saw the Jesuit way of life, the variety of ministries that, that Jesuits are involved in, that was a big draw. Uh, so it could be school, it could be parish, it could be retreat center, you know, it could be preaching retreats, spiritual exercises, which we'll talk about later, uh, university work, university chaplaincy, university professors. I was like, okay, there's a huge range here. And personally, I was always the sort of guy that I didn't really know 
what I wanted to do because I kind of wanted to do everything. Like it was, and the Jesuit, you know, over the course of a Jesuit life, you know, there's a reasonable chance that I could end up doing three or four different things. And that appeals to me. Um, so, yeah. And, but ultimately, you know, you bring these things to prayer and you have all these reasons why, you know, this is attractive and why you're drawn to it. But ultimately you're saying, okay, God, you know, I'm up for this. Is, is this it? Um, and God has to speak to you in some way and sort of confirm it. So that's, that's the process of discernment. And so there's all these reasons, you know, uh, things that attract you, but ultimately it, it does come down to your relationship with God and saying, okay, Lord, if this is it, you know, let me know, you know, uh, show me the way. Um, so everyone's, everyone's vocation story is, is very personal and ultimately comes down to their, their interior life in some way. But yeah, um, God just opened the way for me and, the other thing I have to say is uh, you you have to live it for a while and see, right, okay, I'm going, like, it's one thing to decide to enter and to go for it. Uh, but then, you know, for the first few years, you're kind of saying, okay, um, is this working or not? Uh, is this bringing me closer to God? Is this making me holier? Uh, is, is this a fruitful life for me? Uh, or am I just constantly at loggerheads with the other members of the community and annoying everyone and them annoying me? And it's clear at a certain point, you just, you have to taste and see and, and you judge in some way by experience. Um, that, and that's when you know, yeah, this, I think it's for me. The other Jesuits think it's for me. God seems to be given the green light, you know, and, and, and you test it. So, um, yeah, so that's, so when you say, you know, how did you know? You know, that's a process. That's a that's a that's a process uh, with different stages. That's very interesting because, you know, a lot of people today, and you know, listening to even you know various people talk about discernment, the priesthood, or whatever, a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking, I must know for sure from day one before I even enter the seminary that this is it and it, it, it not even just for priesthood for for any any vocation but it's a it, it there's it, it there's a process there's a process along the way and i suppose that's what we're going to speak to you primarily about tonight because you're a jesuit there's a particular form of discernment very much associated with the with the jesuits um associated with saint ignatius of loyola um and no doubt that was a huge huge part of your discernment process yeah. So one of the the things we did in the in the novitiate was, and this sounds quite extreme, was a thirty day silent retreat. Okay, and uh, it's called the Spiritual Exercises of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, spiritual Exercises, which is uh, an old term in the in the church. It's not. It wasn't a uh, a title which Ignatius Ignatius invented. Uh, but it's a retreat he wrote and borrowing a term uh, from the spiritual tradition of the church uh, from the desert fathers and mothers uh, called the spiritual exercises. Um, so, I, yeah, I just if you'd like, I could just talk a little bit about, about the spiritual exercise and what they are and, and, and eventually how discernment uh, of vocation comes into that. So and I would say first... No, no, can you, I was just going to say, sorry, I think maybe you were just about to say it. I know when we were chatting off camera, there was a, there was an important point that you wanted to, to make first that, you know, uh, it, you know, we can talk, we can talk about the spiritual exercises, but it's very difficult if it's not, uh, if, if it's not within a context. Yeah. So, so for example, for anyone that that's listening here who might be discerning, hopefully be able to apply these methods um to that process but again the discernment process it's very unique and very different to to everyone so like these talks can only you know can be, can be general enough because we can't really it's it's very it, it, you can't get into say what such and such a person is going to experience when they discern about whatever it is yeah and and also when using the ignatius's method of discernment um you also have uh a spiritual guide, a director, or a company, or, um, who knows Ignatius's method, and who is listening to you uh, as you 
tell him or her about your your prayer life and uh, your experiences and who are helping you to use the method. So it's not something you do by yourself. You don't just put up your spiritual antennae and say, oh, today God told me this um, or tomorrow he told me exactly the opposite or whatever. Um, but you're doing it with uh, with somebody uh, who, who knows the method. So yeah, it's, um, it's not a case of, oh, I read the book and now I can do it. Um, it's something which happens within the context of a spiritual direction sort of relationship of, of some kind. Um, the spiritual exercises uh, are for people who want to go deeper in, in their prayer life. Uh, and that includes people who want to discern God's will for their life. Uh, when I say go deeper, uh, you know, another way of, of saying go deeper is to enter, begin, uh, begin praying with uh, mental prayer uh, as opposed to vocal prayer. Uh, so vocal prayer where you, you know, which is excellent prayer, don't get me wrong. You know, we, I, I, I still do it. Uh, but when you're praying out loud or, you know, with words, uh, whether that be a, a devotional prayer like the rosary or uh, the divine mercy chaplet or uh, if it's the, uh, the Office of Readings or, you know, um, that's, that's vocal prayer. When you stop talking and when you have uh, some kind of uh, image or words uh, inside you, um, that, you be, that you meditate on or contemplate, uh, we call that mental prayer. So you're silent, uh, but yet it's still happening inside you. So the spiritual exercises uh, offer a way, offer people uh, a retreat uh, based on mental methods of prayer. Uh, so that's the first thing. And I'll just say a little word about what meditation is and what contemplation is. Meditate, the word meditation has all sorts of connotations today. So meditation for Ignatius anyway, uh, would be typically when you take a piece of scripture and you make that piece of scripture come to life in your imagination. So for example, uh, if you're meditating with the scene of the Annunciation from the Gospel of Luke, uh, you, would, you would read the, this piece of scripture a couple of times. And then, so you become familiar with it. And then you'd close your eyes. And then you would allow that action to sort of unfold in, you know, the, in your imagination, you know, um, in your mind's eye, and you would just see it happening. And you would hear the angel speaking to Mary saying, blessed are you among women. Uh, you would hear Our Lady saying, be it done unto me according to thy word. And, and you would sort of be a present in that scene in some way. You would, you would be intimately present to that. And so there, is, there are images in the prayer, uh, in meditation, in Christian meditation. And you also might want to say something. You know, you might want to interact with the characters in some way. You might you might want to say to Our Lady, I'm, I'm so glad you said yes, you know, and help me to say yes, or, or, or whatever it is. So there's, there's some kind of interaction, there's relationship, you're cultivating a relationship. And, and you might hear Our Lady saying something back to you, you know. Um, that's not to say that Our Lady is actually <laughs> saying this to you. Uh, I'm not, but it's a, but, but let me put it to you this way. If you went into a museum and you saw, for example, uh, there's an icon behind you there of Our Lady. Is that right? Um, um, yeah, it's um, it, it's Our, Our Lady of. Gosh, it, there's a. I know it, she's wearing the mantle of Our Lady, uh, or Our Lady of Life. I think it is. It's from a. Oh gosh, it's. I, I, you caught me in the hop here because the woman okay, who sorry, painted yeah. this, the woman who painted this uh, in the United States. Uh, gave us permission to use it on the Paving the Way Home uh, website. A beautiful, beautiful woman. Uh, we're back and forth, but her name is actually after slipping me now. Okay. Actually, right. You know, whether being, uh, yeah. well, I can I'm, tell even from here, it's, it's a really stunning, beautiful piece of religious art. And that, that came from that, that lady's imagination. And, you know, when we look at it, you know, God could in some way speak to you uh, through that or touch you, you know, in some way. 
when you are through that image. Uh, in the same way, when you allow the scriptures to come to life uh, in your own imagination inside, it's like God is inspiring your internal religious art. It's like you become an artist and through your imagination, you just, okay, you don't paint it. You don't, you know, physically make the painting, but you see it within yourself. And this is how I imagine the scene. And in the same way that that painting could well be inspired art um yes my prayer my image is inspired and and this is what i love about our lady it's wow her her radical openness to god wow and you just it becomes an internal knowledge then so it's sort of helping that journey from the head to the heart we all know that you know our lady uh, was was radically open to to god's word and doing god's will but when you see it in prayer and experience it in your meditation um, and you see that image as, as you've created it, uh, God speaks through that, you know, and, and it, it really allows the message uh, to, to enter, you know, be more rooted in your heart. So that would be an example of a meditation. And Ignatius offers many meditations um, in the spiritual exercises, typically from the scriptures. So you're meditating on the scriptures a lot, allowing the scriptures to come to life. Um, but also uh, he has composed some of his own meditations, which are very powerful too. Uh, so that meditation is one form of mental prayer. Another is contemplation. Uh, and contemplation might happen towards, as a meditation sort of matures and goes on, you might just come to a, a point where you just have a sense of God's presence or, or a grace. Um, and the action has stopped unfolding in a way, and there's a particular grace. And, you know, maybe a sense of being held by God or a sense of wanting to do God's will or, or whatever it is. And you just sort of stay with it. And it's not really an image anymore. Uh, you don't see anything or imagine anything, but it's, it's a grace. It could be God's presence. A bit like Brian, like if you go to adoration, you know, and, you know, maybe you know, after about 15, 20 minutes when you've really sort of relaxed into it, there's just a sense of presence and you don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. You just sort of soak it up. And that, I think, is contemplation, uh, where it's just being in the presence. And um, so... Sorry, for yeah. I can make one point there. And yep. what you say is absolutely fantastic. I just want to highlight one thing uh, that you said. For example, one of the best, one of the best uh, spiritual directors I ever came across was actually during my time in seminary in Rome, uh -huh. uh, the Jesuit. Uh, Father Jim Grummer, uh, an American in uh, in Rome, and he used to come to the Irish College, and for every, uh, particularly every Easter, he'd take us mm. away for five day silent retreat, uh, and that. But he was very much trying to get us into this kind of meditative, contemplative prayer, and particularly in the early part of when I really started getting serious about my faith, it was very much. Um, like very much our, our lady is very much uh, an important part of my life always has been mm. always will and obviously every day we've the we've the rosary we've heard the my mercy chaplets everything but for a while that vocal prayer was the only part it was the only part of my prayer life because i didn't know how to be silent and when people came along and started talking about meditative prayer contemplative prayer first of all i was like whoa this is a bit, mm. I do think is a bit wishy-washy. And when you start it out, when you try to start out with this mental prayer, contemplative prayer, and nothing can happen, and it almost feels as if you're, just in case, in case pe pe people might start out and they might almost feel they're wasting time because nothing's happening. Because sometimes we have to, we fall into the trap of, for prayer to, for prayer to be successful, we have to be doing something the whole time, doing, mm. uh, doing mm. whether it's, or it's particularly it's talking, talking, talking. Mm being there with god and meditating and and i'm and, and not even like i pray the rosary every day uh oh and, yeah i think and i'm not yes. and but like the, the rosary itself is a meditative prayer um but there is that time that silence that silence is key and i can i can understand why ye had to start off with the 30 day silent the silence is key as people say it's the language of god so like even for people starting out in this it's a trap they might fall into is to say nothing's happening this is a waste of time i'm going back to the old way it takes it takes practice yes it does it does and and one of the other things which ignatius 
helps is that the 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 you know one of the nice things about the rosary and you know um divine mercy is that it's structured like it's clear you do this you do this and then you say this and you say this and then you say this there is also a structure to uh, to meditation in in the spiritual exercises so ignatius will say well first of all uh, you say you say a preparatory prayer which is this like god may all my intentions operations and actions be oriented towards you and you know sort of just bring yourself towards god and then you 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 would imagine the scene you know so okay so we're in bethlehem uh, at the birth of jesus uh, and joseph is there and you just sort of set it up in your head um and then you'll ask for the grace so this is very important for ignatius um when you are for example if you are uh, praying with um jesus as he is on his public ministry uh, and jesus is preaching you know the beatitudes for example you would ask for the grace to before you pray you would ask for the grace to know love and follow jesus so god this is what i'm asking this is what i'm wanting from this prayer i want to know jesus i want to love jesus and i want to follow jesus so before we start you know that's that's what i'm asking for and so there's three steps already uh so like you're five minutes in now okay <laughs> i mean you know the time you know, so, um then you will allow the action to unfold before you know there are you, you've read through the the, the piece or the, the scripture piece a little a few times and you close your eyes and you allow it to unfold and you see what you notice and um and then, you know, maybe 20 minutes and maybe then you're entering into contemplation or it's like, oh, I'm feeling still. You know, it takes, it takes time to become silent and still and you know, just the mind. And so, yeah, so then you might be getting into the contemplation and then you'll bring it to an, bring your prayer time to an end. What's very interesting, and I think this is a key difference as well between vocal prayer and mental prayer, um, for Ignatius, okay, you finish up the prayer and then you review it. You say to yourself, okay, what happened there? Let's go over that again. So, and you say, okay, there was, you know, there was a point in that prayer where I was really taken with um, our Lord's uh, preaching, you know, blessed are, blessed are the pure in heart. Like that really got me um and you know i want i want to be pure in heart or, or whatever um and you would note that down and so you're sort of you harvest you know like that the idea of harvesting the graces uh so after each prayer period you look back over you review it and you notice okay here's the real rich spiritual fruit of that. Of, you know so of that 30 minutes there were five minutes in the middle there where i was you know really getting it you know and that's and that's and you and you put that in your diary or your journal and you note it down and and that's sort of what you would bring to your you know your retreat guide or whatever so there's a way in which with vocal prayer when it's done it's done i've prayed now i'll go and do something else with mountain prayer with the with the method and the, the spiritual exercises you pray and then you review it and you really try and notice okay what you know, what were the real graces in that prayer period for me and take note of that and just stay with that. Um, so the review, so anyway, all that to say that, you know, as you rightly said, um, to the uninitiated, uh, mental prayer, silent prayer can seem like, can be frustrating because nothing is happening. And if that is the case for, for any of your listeners and viewers, I would say, well, there are more structured approaches to mental prayer, to meditation and contemplation, and the spiritual exercises is one of those. And, and you know, so there is, there is hope <laughs> and there is, there is help uh, if that is your frustration. That's fantastic. And so one thing that's very much associated with this is called with saint ignatius Loyola and the spiritual exercises is the examining i'm not even mm. pronouncing that right no, that's it that's it yeah the examine. Oh, yeah. okay that was yeah. uh okay i saw it written down as like ex exam yeah. examining yeah how how does that work can you tell us about that okay so uh, the examine has uh has a history of its own uh, it started out in the spiritual exercises as uh an examination of conscience uh really that's where it started. And Ignatius was basically saying, okay, if you have a particular sin 
uh, fault, whatever, that in your daily life you want to work on, uh, you will, uh, at a certain point of the day, you'll stop and uh, you will look back over your day and you'll see, uh, you know, like, did that sin happen? Uh, how many times? Um, and, but the idea of the examine is by doing it every day, hopefully uh, you can see the improvement that, okay, I may not be totally over that sin, but I can see over the last couple of months, yeah, that used to happen 10 times a day and now it happens three times a week. Uh, so it's a way of sort of keeping yourself accountable and going, you know, staying on the right road, uh, not expecting perfection straight away, but, you know, to keep yourself in the right road and keep an eye on something like that. Um, then, uh, so that was how the exam started out in its sort of initial form. Uh, then there's also the exam of, that has sort of evolved into the exam of your whole day. And not just looking for, you know, did I fall into that trap or did I, you know, that temptation or, or that sin or whatever, but uh, where else was God present in my day? So it's often difficult. I think it's a really valuable form of prayer. And um, you see, uh, you know, it can be hard sometimes to notice God in the moment, but retrospect retrospectively, if you look back over a period of time, you can say, oh, that was a blessing. That was a huge blessing. So it's almost sometimes it can be easier to see God in the rear view mirror um, uh, rather than, you know, in front of your face or as you're living uh, your life. And so the, the examine as it is sort of, uh, uh, as it's been popularized today, does look at the sinful element of okay, where where you know did I fall down today or where did I fall short, um, and and resolving to to do better tomorrow with God's help, uh, but also okay, what what were the blessings uh, that I that I received today, and really to to give thanks and praise to God for that. So the exam, I, I yeah, I think the exam is particularly you know if if people are struggling with sin to realize that, yeah, you know, despite my sinfulness, God was completely faithful today and God really helped me out. And, you know, and it's, as I say, when it's looking in the rear view mirror that I can see, oh yeah, God was, God was by my side today. Uh, God had my back, whatever. So it's just being more mindful of how God is present in your day. And um, God's not an abstract reality. God is, God's not up, you know, far up there in heaven, far away from us. Like the Holy Spirit is working in my life, you know, today. So anyway, there's, that would be, yeah, uh, some, so just to say, if people sort of Google the examine, um, you know, it's something like I just said there, that's probably what they're going to get. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's not the examine as Ignatius composed it, but I think it's a very good development um, of the examine. Um, and yeah. So no, it's fantastic because like there's two things you've spoken to about since this interview started. And one was the silence and the other obviously being the examined. But the, the common den denominator between the, both of them is that you need to give time to them. You need to stand back because we live in such a busy world, mm -hmm. uh, a hectic society. And the fact that we have look, we all have majority of us have smartphones where everything, mm -hmm. all these different apps, we, we've done the world at our fingertips. Our days are just absolutely, you know, like we're coming to the end of 2020 already. And it just seems like <laughs> yeah. five minutes. How did, how did that happen? Yeah. We're just, even that like, yeah. whole COVID lockdown began in yeah. March and we're here now at the start of December. Yeah. Like, Joe, I can I, clearly I remember this week. at the start of New, like New Year's last year, I can clearly remember going 2020, you know, I've got a good feeling about this year. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it doesn't seem that long ago yeah um, no it is and, and, and the thing yeah. is like we just re for these things just to be able to take that time to yeah. just step back to, to look back and to as you say to see the blessings because even when there's even when there's trials in our lives when there's a lot going on or you know we're really discerning something that we're just caught in a in, in a cloud in you know in hindsight we'd be able to see where God was maybe afterwards, but even in that moment, we can get so caught up and bothered, but even just to take that step back and say, well, okay, wait a minute, 
where what blessings are in my life where did god make himself known and yeah. it's hugely important it's it sounds like a simple thing but it's easier said than done yeah. and it is so important you know and that's one that's one of the beautiful things about about irish culture you know as as it has been you know formed you know forged in 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 the face there's so many little sayings irish sayings that are profound for example count your blessings like that's not a glib sort of saying you know way of saying oh stop complaining and it was like okay i re- i recognize that you're going through a tough time but don't forget to count your blessings because that's what will actually enable you to live this difficult time like a christian and like a good person and you won't lose heart you won't uh you won't be discouraged like just like the like the evil spirit uh, the devil is always trying to discourage you like discouragement is comes from the devil Jesus is saying, you know, take courage. Uh, don't, you know, to, um, to Corinthians, don't be discouraged. You know, always be encouraged. It's a God of encouragement. Uh, so counting your blessings, like seriously, like taking time to stop and going, that was a blessing. That was a huge blessing. It will keep you on the right road. It really does. So going back to the sp- spiritual exercises for the Nile, I know there, there are three themes that you want to discuss um as you're saying there's a lot more to the spiritual exercises but there are three themes in particular that you wish to discuss and the first is freedom from sin yes brian so the the exercises are divided up into what ignatius calls four weeks which uh, you know originally sort of adds up to 30 days more or less um and the first week is devoted to um freedom from sin um and sin is a tricky topic brian to to talk about today and you know the the church and god and jesus is is not interested in you know shaming and guilting people uh you know just to to feel bad about themselves and and have you know a low opinion of themselves uh just for the sake of it you know it's that's not the goal the goal of talking about sin is not to get people to feel bad about themselves you know that's Okay, it all happens. You know, it happens that right. If you do, you know, there are, we've all done things we're not proud of. You know, so uh, a little bit of guilt is is natural in life. It's normal. Um, but Ignatius uh, really gives it, I would say, a, a good, solid treatment and balanced treatment in the in the first uh, say stage of the of the spiritual exercises ret- uh, retreat um, before he gets you to think about your own personal sin. Uh, Ignatius asks us to pray uh, about and meditate on what is sin? What is it? Um, And uh, what are its consequences? So there's a whole series of meditations about uh, meditating on, for example, the sin of the angels uh, uh, in in heaven um, when the rebellion of the angels against God led by Satan. Um, you know, what was going on there? Uh, so, you know, as of yet, like we're, you know, you as an individual, you know, whoever's doing the treatment are not implicated in this in any way. It's just, okay, this is something in, in the story of our faith and the Christian story that happened. And okay, what's going on there? What does this tell us about what sin is? And ultimately, you know, sin is a decision against God, like not to, not to worship God, not to praise God, uh, to, to reject God in some, you know, big way um uh so there's there's just so there's meditating on that story there's a meditation on the sin of adam and eve uh from uh, from genesis what was going on there um what instead of you know with sin there's always a, a matter of there's god is offering some good god is offering some gift and and humanity says no i i do not choose that gift i i choose my own or i decide to worship something else or or whatever so um so there's a lot of meditation about what is this thing called sin and i think that's really important because for your average you know layman um sin is basically breaking the rules uh there's rules and you better keep them and if you don't keep them you you get punished and if you do keep them, you get a gold star. You know, that's, and just to say that is not the Christian understanding of sin. Like sin, that's called rules. 
<laughs> and that is that is not the Christian understanding of sin. And it's it's unfortunate that people bring that understanding of sin to Christianity and sort of project it onto Christianity. And it's just not true. Um, sin is okay. It's the breaking of relationship, um, and we suffer when we sin. You know, it's uh, you know. Um, I, I think the greatest one of the greatest examples of sin is is alcoholism, addiction. It's like it's clear this is bad for you as much as it is wrong. You know? um, so there's before implicating yourself um uh, in any kind of sin it's like okay coming to a better more nuanced more christian understanding of what is sin and how it is really repugnant and something you generally then once you think about it it's like oh I, you don't want that um so uh so it's a really good catechesis i think actually on on sin and then uh only then, when you have a better understanding of it, uh, and you see it is, you know, it is a, it is a, a, a reality before we are entering, before we're born, you know, sin is a reality in the world, and somehow we're born into this, you know, drama that's gone wrong, uh, you know, to put it that way, and and you see, okay, how is this, uh, how is the sinful element in in human nature, the human story, how you know, how has that entered into my life, and how have I been complicit in that in some way? Um, and often to my own detriment, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tragedy. Sin is a tragedy. Um, and so there's, there's that dimension of it, seeing, you know, how sin has been, you know, your downfall in some ways. The other thing that I've, oh, my word, like I, I still remember, you know, doing the spiritual exercise and being bowled over by this. I mentioned earlier on that one of the steps in, in asking in, in meditating in, in the spiritual exercises is asking for the grace, for asking for a particular grace for that prayer. When meditating on, on, on your sin, and your sinful, your personal sinful history, um, you ask God for the, gra for the grace to show you your sins. Um, and it's amazing. When, you know, we all, we all have this, you know, list of maybe three or four sins that we, you know, typically struggle with. Uh, um, but it's, amazing that when you give God time to show you your sin it's often things that you were just not aware of at all uh, and you know the, the, the cringeworthy thing is that you know other people are probably aware <laughs> you know, it's obvious that you know oh you know Niall oh, he's he, he's a bit of a, a loose cannon or he's a whatever you know he's he's, he's unreliable at times or and it's only when you say to God, oh, God, please show me my sins, um, that in a very gentle way, really, you know, not a not a condemnatory way. It's OK, Niall, here's here's one of the things you've been <laughs> falling short on. And it's um, yeah, it, it, it can really be an eye opener. Um, and again, it's it's not a it's not a huge judgment or condemnation. It's just coming to a little bit more self-awareness, really. You know, it's coming, it's deepening in self-awareness. And that is a grace. Like it is a grace to know your sins because we're oftentimes just completely blind to the ways we've been getting it wrong or the ways we haven't been loving. Um, so it is it is asking God for that grace to sort of in, in God's very compassionate way uh, to show you how, how you've been getting it wrong. And and this is all in the context of mercy. You know, the I mean the the you know, the, the people Jesus couldn't stand in the Gospels were the people who weren't ready to admit their shortcomings and who thought they were perfect. And Jesus was extremely understanding to those who recognized their own shortcomings. So it's in that, uh, you know, merciful um, uh, context that, that you, uh, you, you, you look at your own sins or you ask God to show your sins. Um, and then typically as well, during a, a retreat, you will go to confession. And once you have you know, meditated and, and you have come to this new level of self-awareness, um, you, you bring those sins to confession and, and confess them and receive um, sacramental absolution. So that's, that's a typical thing that happens. In, and it's, it's a freedom from, that's a freedom from sin. Like, yeah, 
that you were trapped in ways that you didn't realize. And uh, having God having shown you that um, it has released you from those you know, harmful uh, patterns or, or whatever uh, and turning over new leaves. So it's, it's a beautiful, yeah, it's, it's a really, as I say, sin is a tricky thing to talk about. And, um, but when, when it's done well, it's liberating. It's really liberating when people realize, you know, the, the harmful uh, things they've been caught up in and, and just, you know, with God's grace, turn over a new leaf. It's liberating. It's, it's freedom. It really is, Brian. So that's, um, uh, so yeah, I know we're, we are going to get to discernment, but, um, but this is, this is an important preamble to, to that. Yeah. No, and it's fantastic. What you say is fantastic. I just want to go back on a point you make, you made there uh, a very key point that was, you know, sin it's not just about rules and regulations but sin sin damages our relationship with god um and you know we have you can have people that you know you often have people or philosophers that go to the ends of the earth to say what is what is the point of our being what is the point of our existence in this world whereas all you do is open the catechism and realize the point of our being is to enter into relationship with God. That's the whole purpose of our being, a relationship. We're here in this earth for a relationship with God. And that's not just our opinion. That's what the church teaches. So anything, anything that breaks or damages that relationship with God is sin. Um, and and that yeah. and it's just very important, I guess, a point you make that we don't fall into the trap of this. Oh, Brian, Brian, can I just put that slightly differently? Just like, like very slightly differently. Instead of saying anything which damages that relationship is sin, I would say sin is anything which damages that relationship. You know, I mean, just to put the focus on the yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like sin. It's anything which damages that relationship. If you, you know, if you say to people, you know, would you like to, you know, have a stronger or a weaker relationship with God? I say, well, I want to have a stronger, you know, uh, more open, whatever relationship with God. Um, you know, that seems perfectly reasonable, but the, the word sin, it's still, you know, because we have all those negative connotations of the word sin, it's, it's, um, yeah, anyway, just to say that, but sin is anything which damages our relationship with God. And, and then it becomes very evident that it's something that we don't want that we need to avoid. Yeah. Bang on, bang on. You couldn't have yeah. said it better myself. And like, I suppose it, it, it's, it's key not to fall into the trap of viewing God as this authoritarian God. And if, like sometimes people might even people listening to this might say okay they're talking about sin but they're not talking about the rules and regulations they talk about just relationship is this getting a bit wishy-washy but it's not it's it's the purpose it's the purpose of a being and even the, the other day i was i was listening to uh, a priest talking about perfect contrition uh, when we go to mm -hmm. confession and the perfect contrition and they said okay when you, when you when you're sorry for your sins are you sorry for your sins simply because you don't want to go to hell and you're just trying to you know go to, to tick that box to kind of get out of the danger zone and if so fair enough but in fact for perfect contrition we need to be looking at it, the fact that we do not want we are sorry for that sin for our sins because it damaged our relationship with god it offended god and and it it damages our relationship uh with god and as you say the relationship that relationship is yeah. the is the central focus another word for relationship is connection connection with you know i mean do, you know um saints were literally incredibly fully connected wired into you know seeped through with imbued with the holy spirit you know it, it's um yeah i think par maybe part of our our poverty of thinking about sin is that we don't realize just how good fulfilling you know full relationship connection with god can be how life-giving it can be and um saints show us that you know they just they show us how um there was one other thing on on relationship as well yeah when you said brian you know that people may feel uncomfortable with the strong focus on relationship here's some words from the mass which just tell us from the highest point of the mass 
the great uh, the doxology before the great Amen, just tell you how relation how relational uh, our faith is through Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is okay, Almighty Father. But through, with, in, they're all relational words. How could you be, you know, they are ways of describing the relationship that it is through, with, and in Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, our faith is, you know, that's the high point of the Mass. It's just telling you how sort of every which way you're in relationship with God, you know, through with it, you know, which way you turn, you know, it's so anyway, there we go. I mean, yeah. Um, so relation is if we weren't in relation with God, Brian, we wouldn't exist. That's just, you know, <laughs> we exist because we are in relationship with because God loved us into being and sustains us. And it's because of this divine reality, this divine relation that we even exist. So let's let's bring that, you know, and we're all in the process of, for, you know, fulfilling that and bringing it to its fullness. So that's, yeah, there's no life without relationship with God. Uh, moving on to the next theme, then the, 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 the title of the next theme is freedom from... Sorry, so the first theme was freedom from sin. In. And the second theme, moving into the, the second week of the second of the four weeks of the spiritual exercises, the second week would be second theme would be freedom for uh, doing God's will, or doing God's freedom will. for so freedom for serving God. Um, so we're moving into the realm of discernment now, Brian, and, and discerning God's will for your life. Uh, Ignatius uh, had a particular let's say, charism for helping people to discern uh their vocation um typically you know whether it was in in his day it was just you know religious life um or like about life or marriage uh, so helping people to discern between those two states um of life and obviously the majority of people are called to marriage um but some people are called to a religious life and about life um so but um i think one thing that that really is a characteristic of Ignatius's approach is that before you get into discerning, you know, the concrete situation that, that God is calling you to, um, how God is calling you to serve him or, or serve the church or, um, and our neighbor, um, Ignatius asks us to become free to do whatever it is that God is calling you to do. So it's a sort of preparatory step uh, before uh, you actually figuring out what it is that God wants you to do. It's, um, can I cultivate a freedom within myself? Or can God, you know, give me a freedom to do whatever it is that God calls me to do? So it's having that radical openness to God's will that our lady had. Effectively, you know, thy will be done. Whatever it is, even if it means... You, you know, in Our Lady's case, uh, sending your Holy Spirit to make, you know, to uh, <laughs> um, make me pregnant with the Son of God. Uh, okay, <laughs> you know, I can, uh, whatever it is. Um, and because when we come to discern um, our vocation, Brian, we're not entirely free. Uh, we haven't given God sort of permission and the green light to call us to anything. We will often say, no. Like God, I will, I will do your will as long as it's this or this, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> and it may not be the case that God is calling you to do that. Nonetheless, um, our, um, our vocation as Christians is to do God's will. Uh, that is how God wants to save us. That's how God wants us to help with the salvation of others. Um, it's God's plan. It's God's will. Uh, we don't have the master plan. God does. And it's sort of recognizing that, okay, God, I'm willing to participate in your redemptive salvific plan for the world, whatever way you want. And now that takes a little bit of work to get there. Okay, and that's what Ignatius really wants us to cultivate and to pray with. Um, so he has a number of meditations 
uh, just where, which is again, always asking for the grace. God, give me the grace to know, love, and follow you. Um, and the one really nice, really, really nice thing about this, about this part of the retreat is that it is by watching how free Christ is uh, to obey the Father. He lived, Christ lived his whole, Jesus lived his whole life in obedience to the Father, doing the Father's will. Uh, and that we learn and cultivate that freedom. So we want to be uh, like Christ, as free as Christ was, at the same time being with Christ. So we know we are doing this with Christ, with Jesus. Um, and just to, uh, this is, this is, I think, quite deep. Um, there's two, uh, if you emphasize one of those over the other, you're, you're, you're heading into um, error, I think. One which is, well, I want to be like Christ, which can just make Christ out Jesus as the model. He is the moral exemplar, and we should all just be like him. But then you can fall into the trap of doing, oh, if I just try hard enough, I can be like Jesus. Uh, sorry, but no, no, you can't. Um, Jesus uh, was divine, was the perfect, he had, he had all the divine grace. Uh, you know, humans, we are fallen, we just can't. We don't, we need, we depend on grace. Um, so that's why you would say, no, so it is, it is with Christ. So that our life, you know, like Christ, you know, our Christ-like life must be with Christ. Um, and it's by being with Christ then that we, we get this grace to be like him. Uh, so again, Ignatius just, you know, in our meditations, it's really emphasizing that be with Jesus so that you can be like Jesus. Um, and it's not, and again, you know, the other way of going wrong there is like, oh, I'm just with Jesus all the time. And I don't really want to change though, because, you know, I mean, it's just me and my bud, like, Jesus is my comfort blanket, whatever, you know, I mean, no, there is a, there's both, you know, it's both and it's being with Jesus so that you can then be like Jesus. Um, and, and as I say, a part of Jesus's way of, of, of showing us the way uh, was being free to do whatever it was uh, that, that the father wanted. And he clearly had to do some very unpopular things. Uh, he clearly had to uh, confront people. He uh, he clearly had to go to the cross. Uh, you know, I mean, things which uh, you know on any other day, if you just wanted a nice, quiet life, you would rather not do. Uh, but it's cultivating that freedom to finally be able to say, "Okay, Lord, uh, I am with Jesus, and I'm going to do whatever it is that you want me to do." Um, so that is. So I just say to anybody who's discerning, you know, just pray. Pray for that grace to be free, uh, to do whatever it is. Before, and you were not, we're not deciding yet. We're not making um, any decisions. We're, um, we're just wanting to be free to, you know, die, to just, to, you know, thy will be done, Lord. You know, thy will be done. And gradually making ourselves more available uh, to uh, whatever it is. Uh, over, often overcoming fear. You know, I mean, it's often fear that keep, oh, I couldn't do that. Well, I'm not, you know, uh, well, that's fear. You know, that's not God. God, you know, if, if that's a fear you have, you know, how many times do you say, don't be afraid? Like, fear does not come from God. Uh, if you're afraid of something, well, then, you know, ask God to take that fear away. Uh, and so you will just be tr more trusting. And so whatever it is, you know, God's going to bring me through it. Um, and I think in particular with the, with the religious life or priesthood, I mean, every man who's discerning priesthood or every woman who's discerning religious life at some point will be assailed by fear. And the thought will come into the head, oh, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to be lonely. I'm going to have no friends. I'm going to be poor. I don't have a house. I don't have my own. You know, it's, and it, that is not from God. That is not from God. Uh, so, right. I, just, yeah. I just want to make a, a point there that I, I actually only heard it from a Dominican priest last night who said, like, the opposite of fear is not courage, it's trust. I thought that was mm -hmm. a fantastic, a fantastic one. But 
it's the same. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was discerning, uh, e- even going into the seminary for priesthood, like all these fears, all these perceptions that come into your mind of what life is going to be like, what, you know, it, it's almost like you're planning out the way your life is going to be. And yeah. in reality, like when you, when you look back, you just laugh as if to say, oh, I couldn't have been so wrong. Yeah. Or, you know, at the, or yeah. a lot of the time, the thing that we really fear most, we look back and say, what was the problem? What, yeah. what an idiot I was. Yeah. And, yeah. and that because I totally got that wrong. Like the, what, what the perception I had in my mind, the reality was completely different. Um, and that, and, and the other thing, I guess, is if, if God is calling to you a path, now it's, you have it's your free will you have the choice to either follow or not but if you if you follow that path despite of you know whatever look whatever path we travel in life there's always going to be bumps along the road always hardships trials but under it that's where you're going to have the most happiness as well if it's the path that god uh that god has traced out for you so it is so crucial to get that discernment right yeah absolutely and and you know and not to it's not you know, it's not like you're saying, you know, it's just going to be a, uh, you know, a, a garden of roses. It's like, no, with God, you're going to say, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, that is going to be hard. Yeah, but, you know, uh, I'll get you through it. And, you know, when you're more in, and I'll introduce a, uh, an important word for discernment now, when you're in spiritual consolation, like when that relationship with God, you know, is, is strong and, and sort of palpable, you're saying to yourself, yeah, that is going to be hard. And you know what? I'm up for it. Let's do it. Yeah, like marriage is going to be hard. Like there are, you know, having kids is going to be hard. Uh, and you know what? It's totally worth it. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, because I want to I want to be a loving person. I want to serve. I want to I want to give of myself. Um, I want to, yeah, I, I want to be in on this whole Christian thing and this God thing. Yeah, let's go for it. Um, so whereas if you're in desolation, which would be more under the influence of the evil spirit or sort of listening to the thoughts of the evil spirit. It's like, Oh, that's going to be hard. Oh God. No, I'll just, I'll just back out now. That's, I couldn't do that. That's, that's coming to things with a spirit of discour- a discouraged spirit. And at the first sign of um, difficulty that you just sort of say, Oh no, not, not for me. Uh, whereas the consoled spirit will say, you know, like I go back to our lady, uh, yeah, uh, if I show up to Joseph pregnant, uh, that's going to be really difficult. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so be it. God, God, you know, God will bring you through. Uh, so, um, just so, yeah. So it's not being naive about difficulties and hardships, but not being discouraged by them and just sort of saying, yeah, okay, so be it. Um, you, you take the rough with the smooth. Um, yeah. So, so that's so that's all, and yeah, sort of riffing on the theme there of freedom for, uh, freedom for doing God's will, whatever whatever that may be, thy, thy will be done. Uh, the can I move on to the third? Yeah, theme then? Yep. Then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, third theme then is actually discerning God's will. Uh, now that you've come to a place of greater freedom, say you know, greater openness to doing whatever it is that God wants you to do. Uh, well, actually discerning, well, what is that? Uh, and Ignatius gives three methods, actually, of, of discernment in the exercises. And, and again, like this may not all be done in the context of a retreat. You know, I mentioned the 30-day retreat earlier. It's, uh, it's more common for people just to do an eight-day retreat, an eight-day side retreat. And, you know, they may, they may bring this question of discernment into that retreat and you'll go through some of the discernment exercises that Ignatius offers. Um, but it, it may also be done, you know, over a period of months with your, with your spiritual director. And uh, so there, there are three, there are three methods which Ignatius offers. The first is the simplest uh, and it's just when you know, uh, when, when God just fills your heart with this, overwhelming certitude and, and knowing that this is the way and it's it's you can't doubt it uh, it's just as clear as day so ignatius gives the example of matthew the tax collector uh, just leaving 
his work and following Christ. It's like, okay, I don't need to sit down and talk with the spiritual director for a few months to figure this one out. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm following. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, yeah, that, that's the first method. And there's not much more I could really say about that. Um, but if it, you, you know, because you know, yep. you know, uh, and that's a very beautiful thing to happen in somebody's life. Um, the second is uh, the discernment of consolations and desolations. Uh, so uh, consolation is when we are under the influence uh, of the Holy Spirit, the Good Spirit. And uh, our thoughts and desires are sort of in harmony uh, with God's. Uh, and it is characterized by, Ignatius explains, by sort of having a heart that is aflame uh, for our God and creator. And everything we want to do is for the service and love of our God and creator. So it's in, so you're really for discerning your vocation with this way. It's about, uh, you know, finding that pathway that over time, I've said not just a once off, but over time uh, uh, gives you this spiritual movement of consolation. Um, I know what you're gonna ask, Brian, is, is that just a nice feeling? <laughs> is that like when you get the feels and you know, the lovey dovey? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's not. It's not there. There may be feelings associated with it, but uh, emotions. But it is a spiritual movement. Hmm. Uh, so, as I said, Ignatius uh, describes it as your heart is aflame with love for your Creator, uh, and you know, encouraged uh, um, in love with God. Uh, yeah, and um, as opposed to uh, desolation. Uh, which I alluded to earlier, which is this discouragement, um, you know, fearful, uh, anxious, um, draw, drawn away from God. Uh, you know, God doesn't love me. Uh, I'll never be able to do that. Uh, I think I'll just have another beer. Uh, you know, like just really, you know, the wind totally gone out of your spiritual sails. Uh, and it's just important to recognize when you are discerning because you are sure like when you're at that point of making a decision the evil spirit will be trying to knock you off balance or you know deflect you or make you do something less good or or whatever uh, the evil spirit does not want you to do god's will and so it is important to recognize okay for me what is it like when I'm sort of following the plans of the Holy Spirit and the thoughts and the inspirations. Um, and what is it like when I am under the influence of the evil spirit and I am moving away from God's plans? Um, that it, so there are, there are rules, uh, you know, guidelines for noticing and perceiving and understanding uh, these interior movements, uh, which are more than feelings uh, in your soul and Ignatius gives gives those rules and the exercises. I don't think it would be so much it would be helpful now necessarily to to go into that in greater detail because for those to be useful, you really need somebody to be actively discerning something. Yeah. Um, and to be bringing their story, you know, and, and sharing their story, and somebody who is who is knowledgeable of the rules, be able to point out ah. That sounds like desolate. That sounds like you're in desolation that day. Yeah. You know, or so I wouldn't make an ignition that you don't make decisions when you're in desolation. You just yeah. do not make decisions when you're in desolation. Uh, when you're in consolation. So, you know, for, for me, Brian, um, that whole summer uh, before I entered the Jesuits, once I decided, I was going around telling you know what I'm doing in September, I'm joining the Jesuits and I can't wait. You know, uh, like, can I tell you my good news? Yeah. Um, which was such a, you know, with a joy and a lightness and, you know, uh, yeah, it was clear I was in consolation and 
you know, my heart was full of the love of God and I wanted to do great things for God. And this was how it was going to happen. Uh, so, yeah, um, it's and it's something that lasts. It's a joy that lasts. It's not a flash in the pan. Um, it's really a joy that lasts and stays. And when you're in, yeah, I mean, assuming that you're living a good life and you're praying and, you know, um, it's, you know, you'd be fooling yourself if you're sort of in the bars sort of seven nights a week and saying that, yeah, I'm in consolation because I feel great. No, you're in you're You feel great because you're under the influence of alcohol, not under the influence of, of the Holy Spirit. Sorry. Um, so this is assuming that you're living, trying to live a virtuous life. And, you know, um, so, uh, yeah, so Ignatius gives those rules. So that would be, um, yeah, that, that, that's an example. That, that would be the second method of, of discerning your vocation according to the spirit, the interior spiritual movements uh, that you're experiencing. How would you differentiate between the desolation that you're describing there and, for example, we often we often hear about the spiritual desolation of you know some of the saints like even mother teresa um i know saint john of the cross uh people like that um and that how how do you because yes. i know I, I, like as you say the you know the, the desolation that you're talking about it can be you know it can be it can be a a, a trick of the devil um in, and in the other cases, you know, uh, at the same time, for anything to happen like that, God still has to allow it, yes. but he allows things for a greater good. How do you differentiate that? You're spot on. Thanks for bringing that up, Brian. So when you're in this, so Mother Teresa, you know, say, you know, she's, she's in desolation. She does not feel this, you know, great desire to, to uh, or feeling, you know, to, to, to pray and to serve and do God's will. She knows, she is aware that she is in desolation and that she doesn't have this inclination, let's say, to, to pray and, you know, this great love for the things of heaven. But she doesn't go with that feeling. She goes with what she knows is the right thing to do. And, and so in the rules for discernment, Ignatius would say, okay, if you are in desolation, if you, you know, somehow the wind has been taken out of your spiritual sails and you don't feel like you don't have this desire uh, to pray or to serve God or whatever, in those situations, you think, you go to your head and you say, what is the right? I'm not trusting my sort of inclinations, my desires at the moment because they're leading me in the wrong way. Um, they're leading me away from God. So I'm going to think and I'm going to make a decision to pray and to do the opposite of what the evil spirit wants me to do. Uh, so that's that's very clear in um, yeah in, in Ignatius's description of desolation. Okay, you have this inclination, sort of away from God, or you know, to oh, I'll just have another beer, you know, whatever. I'll, um, uh, I'll just I'll, whatever. I'll, I'll just go sin, whatever. You know, I mean. Um, you just, you stop and you notice and you go, okay, this is desolation. Uh, if I were to follow those inclinations, this is where it would lead me. And in desolation, your head is your friend. And you say, I'm not following that path. I'm going to take my rosary out. And I'm going to pray. And that's so, you know, you just don't, um, yeah. You So you have to know, okay, when and what, in what, times and what situations are my desires and my inclinations you know my spirit my inner movements sort of trustworthy and in what situations are they not uh, so that's why you need the rules to sort of go okay when in desolation you don't go with your gut feeling you go with your head and you say okay i'm getting the rosary out and i'm just praying until this passes and i'm not making any decisions i'm not making any changes i'm not you know, um, I'm just going to get the rosary out or whatever. I'm going to go to mass. I'm going to go to confession. I'm going to fast today, whatever. And that's what our, that's what uh, Mother Teresa did for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is like incredible. Yeah. 
it's amazing yeah. as as you as chat there um when you talk about desires and and feelings and emotions and look these are all things that that god gave gave us but like mm. even as you as you spoke there you know knowing when to go with them when not when to use the head and what yeah. really strikes me was particularly in ireland over the last five years with all the different uh referendum we had and it was very interesting was the pitch that was put out the whole time was appealing to people's emotions feeling mm -hmm. uh, appealing to people's feelings and that and a lot of you, you're listening to there wasn't a lot of logic and there wasn't a lot of maybe setting back and thinking about it now that's only a, a simple example we see it in society in the media in uh, mm -hmm. in the secular world the whole time where feelings emotions desires are all being uh, mm. targeted so to speak Manipulated. Um, yeah. and, and that like i guess if you were in in, in marketing uh the, you, you know I, i'm imagining if you're in marketing you'd be saying you know what to this let's appeal to the like, even if a simple ad comes on television regarding say a chocolate bar and it's it's to the desires the desires yeah. of it, the desires that yeah it's yeah, amazing that's, that there's, there's yeah like billions of of euros and pounds are, are generated from mm. tapping into people's desires yeah, and projecting it onto some product yeah that's how that's how it works yeah absolutely um so it's important to kind of be savvy and to realize do you know what you know that chocolate bar probably isn't going to <laughs> make me more attractive to the opposite sex or, or whatever uh yeah just to to use your head a little bit yeah yeah not that there's anything wrong with a chocolate bar. I mean, I love chocolate, but yeah. <laughs> oh, here, here you're talking yeah. to another one here. <laughs> as you, um, even in your journey, no doubt, your journey, even when you entered 2009 to, you know, to the day uh, of your ordination, even that particular time, no doubt there were so many ups and downs along the way, um, because it's all part of any journey um, with God, and God's going to, a, uh, like, out of his charity out of his mercy out of his love for us he's going to allow bumps and and trials to come away because he knows it's only through these that our relationship with him will strengthen that we will that that will grow in in virtue in uh in, in 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 whatever but i guess as you're saying there what's key is how you approach them yeah um and not to be yeah not to be discouraged uh, you know, by the hard days when you get knocks, you know, some, some of your bad days, you know, are, they're totally down to yourself, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, I stayed up till 2am watching Netflix, <laughs> you know, it's no wonder I feel like crap today, you know, or, you know, I didn't pray properly, you know, hardly for the last week, of course, I'm at a low ebb, you know, uh, it's, uh, and in those times, he's okay, just don't make any rash decisions, you know, just, Okay, just get yourself back, you know, in the good habits and and the good disciplines, and um, get yeah, get yourself get yourself reconnected, you know, and and then things will um, will will move easier. Um, yeah, so the um, yeah Ignatius sort of that's one one of the ways that he he portrays the the consolation, you know, the good spirit. You know, for the for the soul that is going from good to better and that is advancing in virtue and in prayer and everything, you know, the good spirit sort of opens doors and uh, you know uh, paves the way a little bit and uh, makes you know uh, uh, whereas the good the evil spirit is trying to put obstacles in your way and you know trip you up and you know discourage you and you know no for the soul that's you know going from good to better. Yeah, like the, the evil spirits just, or sorry, the good spirits just, it's just opening things up and encouraging you and, uh, you know, yeah, that's a risk worth taking or, you know, just, uh, yeah, it just, it, it, yeah, good spirits make, wants to, wants to make it easier for you and encourage you and make things happen. And like Jesus wants good things to happen, you know, like more than any of us, yeah. Jesus really wants good things to happen. So um, it's just getting into that sort of stream of grace and um, yeah, like for all, you know, for all uh, Mother Teresa's uh, darkness and desolations, you know, she, she was faithful in prayer and, you know, God worked miracles in her life. Like he opened doors, he, 
you know, she could talk to any world leader she wanted, you know, she, you know, she, she moved mountains, you know, um, so yeah, um, and, you know, God delivers, you know, God always delivers, so um, yeah, just and to always have our shape, return to that word, trust, trusting in that, um, and, and entering, you know, moving into life with that courage and uh, that God wants us to have. Yeah, and in listening to all of this, I think what, what what's key as well is, and it's a thing that we all feel comfortable with, is that vulnerability. I guess there has to be, in order for us to be open, there has to be that vulnerability, that vulnerability to, you know what, to allow God to lead us into the unknown, lead us into uncharted territory uh, for ourselves that, you know, like, the example you mentioned earlier on there uh, of a lady at the at the Annunciation, um, you know, there was, she was probably thinking, "What's Joseph going to say? What are the what are all the people going to say? What are the you know the gossips in the village going to say? What are the neighbors going to say? Yeah, what are yeah. the neighbors going to say? What am I? Yeah. What's my my father going to say? All these yeah. things. The thing was, you know what? It does not matter because if this is what God wants for me, it does not matter. And it's yeah. the same with us. We can overthink things sometimes, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. and. And it like okay, of course it's important to discern and think we can overthink in a way that almost that we almost confuse perception of reality that we go, oh, this is how it's going to be, when in fact mm-hmm. God is saying, No, trust in me, trust, trust in me, trust in me, trust in me, and the path mm-hmm. this is the path I want for you. Yes, you do not know what's gonna happen next. Yes, you do not know the different reactions, da da da. But you know what? Just trust and I'll lead mm-hmm. you. I'm even just yeah. thinking the day I entered seminary in 2011 and I hadn't told my friends, uh, my close friends and all that. And I actually, I actually, some of the people, my, even my mother was saying, you better tell them. I was like, oh, hold on. And I even came to the day I entered. And as I was driving through the gates of the seminary, sent a group text to everyone, turn off the phone. And I was like, I, was like <laughs> I knew we were being, we were being sent on a, uh, for an asylum retreat down in Ross Cray for uh, for for a few weeks, so we weren't going to allow any phone, and that was me. I was like, and I was yeah. dreading the what they're going to think. Oh, what again? Yeah. And yeah, look at the start. There was one or two uh, unusual negative reactions, but after that, like what I was thinking in my mind and, what, and reality, it was completely different. So yeah, 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 yeah. Like the, the that's the thing. Like the the evil spirit is makes a big show you know and oh it's going to be awful it's going to be terrible you're going to be so unpopular you're you're, you're going to burn these bridges uh but uh ignatius characterizes the, the the evil spirit as a coward that there's this big show but like once you like your best defense with the evil spirit is attack and you just literally say evil spirit just buzz off i'm not interested i'm not buying and i'm not listening to you and he was just fleas like like you know demons are cowards like they're absolute cowards they, once you stand up to them like and they just they run away mm. you know like the big show at the start trying you know but if you give an inch like they'll take them you know they'll take a mile but yeah. you don't give an inch you stand up you stand for and you go no i'm not interested i'm taking the roads right and praying so you can go have fun somewhere else you know i'm, I'm not buying um and yeah, so look, in your own case, it was like that. It's like, oh, it's going to be terrible. And you know, it wasn't. You know, yeah. It just, yeah, not at all. People were probably really proud of you and for trying and for giving a go. And, you know, um, yeah. But, and and also, Brian, I, I have to say for, for leaving seminary as well, which is an, an equally brave decision. Uh, yeah, I, and a hard I day. often say it was uh, the hardest decision I ever had to make was uh, leaving seminary. Entering mm-hmm. seminary, yeah, it took a, a, a you know a lot of discernment and um, and all that, but leaving it was without a doubt the hardest thing because it wasn't as if I I was hating my time there. It mm-hmm. wasn't as if I was. It wasn't like I I loved it, but yet what what I guess what was happening over a, particularly over the final year was slowly and and. The, I ended up having to really embrace the silence and that um, mm. and the discernment mm. that you were talking about. And it was like mm. God was saying, no, step me out of the boat. But my biggest fear was, okay, but if I do this, what next? What am I mm. going to do? And he was like, trust, trust. But my thing was, I was like, yeah, no problem. I'll follow you. But 
You know, you yeah. need to tell me what you planned or blah, blah, blah. I trust in you completely, God, but you need to tell me first what you, what you yeah, had. And it was yeah. all these kind of traps that fall into. And it was like, yeah. you know, and I remember the day I left, I was, I couldn't even look back as I was walking out because I, I was, there was tears coming down and everything. Yeah. And, and that but yet i knew i was doing the right thing um and that and you know obviously the the path god was leading me to you know here i am i'm happily married with three beautiful three beautiful daughters could never have imagined this back in 2011 when uh when i entered but yet knowing this mm. if i had a time all over again i'd still do the seminary again because the things i learned good things about myself that I didn't know, but I learned a lot of bad things about myself that mm. I didn't know either that I need to grow. And, and particularly when you're, well, particularly when I was in Rome and it was a smaller house and you're living in community with others and, you know, mm. personalities and different personalities. Mm. And next you go, gosh, like in your heart, why am I reacting like that? And I never mm. realized that. And next you have to work on this. And, and, mm. and, you know, God was forming me the whole time for, for, for marriage. And it, it was yeah. fantastic. But, yeah. you know, even, even when I entered seminary, I was like, Okay, this is it. I'm going to be a priest. And then I was thinking of all the different things. And, you know, you just have to take one day at a time yeah. and just trust, listen, and follow God and whatever, wherever he's leading you. Yeah. Like, I think you're so right, Brian. You, you, you go in, you give it a go, but, you know, you're still discerning. You know, when you're, uh, you're dating, you're dating, you know, and it's like, okay, you know, you haven't made any big commitments. So you're, this is all grist for the mill you know and you're, okay is this is this going to work and yeah you you give it a good shot and then you see you know so yeah i yeah you've you've a history of making brave decisions brian i admire you <laughs> <laughs> yeah Brilliant track record. yeah i'd say i've like, yeah taking the scenic yeah. route but uh, there you go yeah. that's good. it um that's that's all i i have to say really brian about the spiritual exercises there is um there is a prayer uh, which I'd like to share with you, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, it's from it's from the very end of the spiritual exercises, and I think it it sums up a lot of who Ignatius was uh, and how he how he lived his 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 Christian vocation and his Jesuit vocation. And it was really seeing uh, the spirit of the prayer is that Ignatius recognizes that God has given everything to him. God has given God's own self to him. You know, I mean, the gift of his son, like. God is constantly, you know, in this self-donation, you know, giving of himself to, to the world and to us. And Ignatius just wants to give himself back. Like, and, in, in the, you know, uh, you'll never outdo God in generosity, but it seems to Ignatius the only appropriate gesture that I can make in response is to offer myself back. So in that context, this is, this is um, what we call the Sushi Pei prayer from Ignatius of Loyola. Take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and possess. You gave it all to me. To you, I return it. All is yours. Dispose of it entirely according to your will. Give me only the love of you together with your grace. For that is enough for me. Um, so, um, just give God thanks, really, for uh, all the blessings uh, that He has given us, uh, Brian. Thank God for for your family there, uh, your wife and, and beautiful three beautiful children, uh, for the gift of this podcast, for the gift of faith, and just recognizing uh, how much God has given us in that spirit of generosity that we just say to God, yes, I am available to you. Uh, I realize how much you've done for me and how much you have served me, uh, really. And I also want to serve you. Um, and so take of me and dispose of me as you want. Um, amen. And Father Niall, thank you so much. And thank you for your your openness to, to follow God. And, you know, part of part of the, the the whole thing of this podcast as well as you know from from our time in Atlanta myself and our time in U2000 we, we were saying look there are so so many fantastic uh Irish priests out there that uh, a lot of people don't realize and you know your 
obviously you're 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 one of them and um look just to say thank you thank you for being open to um you know to the gift of the of the, of the priesthood and for you know for following god and for being such a for being such a witness because i have no doubt that there's there particularly if there's any lads watching uh going to watch this episode that are just discerning themselves you know it's, it's it's just fantastic to 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 come across particularly a newly ordained priest who's 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 gone through it all and uh and that so thank you so much thanks Brian. it's been a great pleasure i really enjoyed our conversation this was, so did this I. was great it's just a good chat yeah so we covered a lot of ground no because i know even when we first made contact uh there uh, a couple of months ago back in in september i was really really looking forward to this so yeah. it was um no it was excellent so yeah. look thank you so much for tonight super right good night okay. god bless